All right, we've made it to our final section of this unit. It's been a long time, but we're finally making it there. And we want to look at a couple of different uh, goals. And this is where I told you again, this is where the calculation is going to come in. So a little bit of math, but it's usually going to be based off of similar formulas. So we can uh, plug and chug our way through a lot of the information. So 4.07, I can calculate the amount of energy, heat transferred, sorry, heat capacity, the heat capacity of a substance, the energy associated with phase changes, and the delta H of a reaction. A lot of stuff, but don't worry, we're going to work our way through it piece by piece. And 4.08, I can interpret diagrams and calculate the amount of energy transferred in an isolated system. That's going to actually bring in the idea of calorimetry and how we're going to use calorimetry um, in this class and through the lab that we'll have um, after the break. But let's go ahead and get started. Now, we talked about state functions before, and remember we said state functions are not so much concerned with how, but the fact that energy or something is used. The internal energy for a system is going to be a state function. Now, next we're going to move into this word enthalpy. Enthalpy, sorry. I'm going to make sure I, I stress the enthalpy because we're going to talk about later in the year entropy, which is very similar but very different. So, enthalpy, or usually represented by capital H, is the heat transferred between system and surroundings under constant pressure. So, if we think about this, if I have a beaker on the table, atmospheric pressure is being applied. Therefore, we're going to end up with what's called constant pressure. Now, enthalpy is also going to be a state function. And as we talked about before, when delta H is positive, we're going to have endothermic reaction. So, we see a relationship side between Q and delta H which is our heat. And also, we have here, delta H is negative, it's going to be exothermic, just like we had with Q. So we can start to predict some of the, um, some of the um, interactions and some of the energy relationships based on these values. Now, enthalpies of a reaction. Again, we can only measure the change in enthalpy. We cannot say, I know the exact um, absolute enthalpy. So how we do that is, Delta H, the change in enthalpy, is equal to the final energy or enthalpy minus the initial. What energy did I have at the end and subtract what I started off with. For a reaction, this looks like this. The delta H for the reaction is going to be equal to the enthalpy of the products minus those of the reactants. Because again, these are our starting point. And this is our finishing point, our final. Now, the enthalpy the enthalpy change that accompanies a reaction is going to be called the enthalpy of the reaction or the heat of the reaction, usually seen by delta H with this Rxn at the bottom for reaction. So let's look at um, the example we have here. So for two moles of hydrogen plus one mole of oxygen, this is going to form two moles of or two molecules of water. Now, for this overall reaction, we're going to see that the delta H of the reaction is negative 483.6 kilojoules. This tells us that 483.6 kilojoules of energy are going to be released to the surroundings when we form water. So the reaction would feel like it gives off heat. Now, you want to be very, very careful when you read questions like for the AP exam because it may ask, ask a simple thing like, how many joules of energy are released? I know this is a little ahead of the game, but if it asks how many joules of energy are released, is it necessary to write the negative sign? No, because if it already tells you that it's released, it's, con it's already accounted for the fact that the energy is going to, or the sign would normally be negative. And so you would just need to write in the 483.6. But if it asks what's the change in energy, then you would have to make sure to put the negative sign there. Again, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Now, when we look at equations like this, that include our energy transfer, we're going to call these thermochemical equations. And yes, it is important when we deal with the states of them. That's why we have the gas, gaseous state for each of them. If they were going from liquid to a gas and then from a gas into the overall reaction, we'd have more energy transferred between the system and surrounding. So we want to make sure we pay very, very close attention to those things. Now, Enthalpy is what we call an extensive property, which means it's going to depend on the amount of the reactant that you actually start with. Um, things like density, 
um, things like uh, color, um, those are going to be intensive property. It doesn't matter how much you have, she's going to have the same value. But if we're dealing with extensive properties, like we're dealing with here for the balanced equation, if I change the moles of my reaction from methane, the combustion of methane, you notice that I also double my energy output. I went from producing 802 kilojoules of energy because I increased uh, my relationship and my values. I end up producing now 1600 or 1604 kilojoules. Now, if you reverse the reaction, you reverse the sign of delta H. So instead, if I'm going from instead of the combustion of methane, the formation of methane and oxygen by combining carbon dioxide and water. I actually now have a positive 802 kilojoules, or if I doubled it again, positive um, 1,604 kilojoules from that. Now, this is where I said it depends on the state. This is where the state part comes in. Still the same old reaction, but you notice now instead of a gaseous form, I'm bringing in the liquid form of water. This is going to change how much energy I actually lose in the combustion. And it actually loses more energy because some has to go off of those molecules that were before moving about is actually going to um, decrease a little bit more. So as you see here, for two moles of liquid water to turn into a gas, I'm going to have a positive 88 kilojoules. So me and going the opposite way, I'm going to lose, um, if I have to go from gas to a liquid, I'm going to lose that 88 kilojoules of energy. Now, calorimeters. Calorimeters are going to actually measure the heat flow and I wish it was nice for us to be able to say it does all the calculations for us but we get a chance to look at what happens in the system and without having to worry about energy being left um, and thrown out to too many of the surroundings. It's going to give us what we call an isolated system. An open system meaning the energy can just flow wherever it wants or an isolated system here what we're dealing with where everything is confined and we try to limit or cut off completely the energy being transferred outside. Now, when we do this, this also gives us a constant pressure. So this will be a simplified one like what we might use in, in our class. Two styrofoam cups, given a stronger insulation, cork stopper, or even sometimes a piece of cardboard, stir rod, and a thermometer so we can actually measure the change in temperature. Or more sophisticated, which we, what we call a bomb calorimeter, um, where the reaction will take place inside a little holding cup. The rest will be filled with water, and we measure the energy transferred to the water, the change in temperature for the water. Now, to measure heat or Q, we have a uh, Q. Sorry, we have a couple of things that we have to look at. We have to look at what's called heat capacity. That's the amount of energy required to raise the temperature of an object one degree. So if I have a block of iron and I want to find out the heat capacity, I'm going to look at the amount of energy it takes to take the whole block one degree Celsius higher. Molar heat capacity, oops, sorry, I got to go back. Molar heat capacity is the heat capacity of one mole of the substance. So it's going to be a little bit uh, more uh, specified where heat capacity is just looking at overall however large the material is. Molar heat capacity is if I have one mole of that substance. So I need to know approximately what the mass of one mole of that would be to raise that um, that substance, that amount of that substance, one degree Celsius. Now, the ones that most people tend to uh, have confusion with is you notice this is a capital C and we have specific heat which is a lowercase c and yes that is important. This is going to be the amount of energy that's needed, or amount of heat that's needed, sorry, to raise the temperature of one gram of the substance, one degree Celsius. So again, heat capacity, large block, molar heat capacity, one mole, specific heat, one gram. So it gets a little bit more specific as we go down. Now, most of the time we're going to deal with specific heat because it's a little bit easier um, for us to notice or to work with. Now, to find that, or to one formula that we use a lot to find our um, our specific heat is we're going to use what's called Q equals MC delta T. Delta again being the change. Our 
units that we're going to deal with most times for specific heat are going to be joules per gram times degree Celsius. Or if we're dealing with calories, calories over uh, per gram times degree Celsius. Each time, notice you're still dealing with Celsius. So the Q equals the grams, the mass of the substance in grams, times the specific heat times the change in temperature. Let's look at an example. How many joules of heat will raise the temperature? Oh, sorry. How many joules of heat will raise the temperature of 50 grams of water from 25 degrees Celsius to 75 degrees Celsius? Using our formula, let's take a look at what we have here. We say Q equals the mass in grams. So we had 50 grams of water. We have 50 grams of water here. Times our specific heat of water, which was given to us on the previous page, 4.18 joules per gram times, uh, times degree Celsius, times the change in temperature. The change we have in temperature is we go from 25 to 75, we're going to go up 50 degrees. So, plugged into our value, in order for this to happen, we release, or sorry, we actually have transferred or put into the system 10,450 joules of energy. Now, if I'm dealing with any type of system, because I'm trying to find the Q or the heat of the solution, notice that the heat of the reaction is going to be the negative value because if we have energy transferred between system, heat lost by one is going to be gained by the other. So if the heat or energy is lost by the solution, that means it's going to be gained in the overall reaction and vice versa. Now, what is the heat molar heat capacity sorry, for water? Well, we actually get a chance to go down a little bit in information. We have capital C equals the specific heat times the molar mass. That's what this capital M is. Not molarity in this case, it's actually for molar mass. So we have our specific heat, 4.18 joules per gram times centimeters times the molar mass, which is approximately 18 grams per mole. And this gives us 75.2 joules per mole times centimeter. Most times we won't be finding the, the molar heat capacity, but we do want to keep this formula in mind because it will come into play a little bit later. Now, for our overall reaction, what happens if it's not carried out in one step as we would normally think, but it actually takes a couple steps in order to do to, to um, get the final information for our reaction? Then we get to apply what's called Hess's Law. Hess's Law basically says if a reaction is carried out in a series of steps, the delta H for the reaction is the sum of all those steps. So it's independent of the number of steps and it's just based on the amount of energy in each of those steps. So Let's take a look at what we have here. The formation of, we're still looking at the combustion of methane, that's what you have here. And we found out earlier that the delta H for that reaction is negative 802 kilojoules. But we have to take into account that we said we want to pay attention to what's happening here. We don't actually have gaseous water, we actually have liquid water. So how much energy is lost when we go from gas to liquid? Well, we lose 88 kilojoules. So now we have to add all that into our value. So eight, the negative 802 minus 88, degree, uh, 88 kilojoules gives us negative 890 kilojoules. This gives us a way to calculate the energy for many steps that are kind of difficult. So we can't. So we don't have to necessarily worry about, well, here we had grand, uh, gas, now we have liquid. Well, how do we know what's going on? Now, for these types of questions also, you'll usually have a table that you can refer back to. So don't think you have to memorize these values. There'll be a table or it'll be somehow given to you in the question so you can actually answer it. Now, this is gonna take us many times to look at what we call the enthalpy of formation or the heat of formation that's gonna be drawn in there. And you see this as delta H with the subscript F. Now, for what we're looking at here, for the formation of carbon dioxide, you notice 
carbon plus oxygen is going to yield carbon dioxide gas and the heat of formation will be negative 393.5 kilojoules meaning that much energy was released when we form this compound this is how we'll actually start to look at what we had on our previous slide for our water okay now this is usually going to be based on the standard conditions or standard state which is one atmosphere and two, uh, 25 degrees celsius or 298 degrees Kelvin. Now, standard enthalpy, still delta H, but you notice now we have this little, almost looks like a degree symbol there. Whenever you see that, it just means that it's going to be standard. It's going to be measured when everything is in its standard state at, at these conditions. And standard enthalpy of formation, same type of situation, except now we're looking at one mole of the compound with all of their substances at the standard states at this one atmosphere and 25 degrees Celsius. Now, <clears throat> there's more than one state for the substance under standard conditions. The more stable one is actually going to be used. What do I mean? Dealing with carbon, we tend to use graphite because graphite is more stable than diamond. So by definition, the standard enthalpy of formation for a stable um, form of an element is zero. Why is this? Because it actually requires no energy in order to form it. So you'll see this when we deal with, say, carbon graphite here. When we deal with our diatomics, as we're dealing with here, oxygen gas or bromine, which normally in its standard state is a liquid, all of those will equal out to zero. No energy has to be expended to make them. Now, using that information, we can actually find the delta H for the reaction by just following a simple pattern. Our delta H for the reaction, standard delta H for the reaction, is equal to the sum of the moles of the substance, sorry, the standard unit for formation for the product, minus the sum of the moles of the product, uh, sorry, the reactants, with their delta H values, standard heat of formation values. These are going to be taken, these M and the N, uh, N and M, are going to be taken from the balanced equation. So let's go ahead and do practice. So we're still using Hess's law, so don't think we've cast it to the side. <coughs> Use Hess's law to calculate the delta H for the reaction and gives it to you right there. We have propane, and it's already balanced out the combustion of propane. So we need to look at and see, okay, the products that we form. We get three moles of carbon dioxide and four moles of water from the elements. Let's take a look at it and see how we'll actually form this. So three moles of carbon time, uh, plus three moles of oxygen are gonna produce three moles of carbon dioxide. So we tripled what we originally had. Same thing for our water, four moles of hydrogen plus two moles of uh, oxygen gonna form four moles of water in liquid form, quadrupled it. Now, have to do the same thing for the reactant. Now, if you notice, Sorry, and we note this a little bit earlier, that oxygen itself has no enthalpy of formation because it's in its elemental state, it's in its diatomic state. So we only have to focus on the formation of methane, which is going to be three moles of carbon or four moles of hydrogen, give us C3H8 gas. Now, let's actually pull in the values, and they're actually given to you in the textbook. I don't think it's uh, page 177, I'll adjust that for you. But I'm going to use our formula to figure this out. So the delta H for the reaction, we have our three moles, our three we took from our products for our carbon dioxide, which is negative 393.5 kilojoules, plus four moles, four times, negative 285.8 kilojoules. I'm going to go ahead and add this value up and get our final here, minus what we have for our reactants which is just for the, the production of methane, which is negative 103.85 kilojoules. After going through, adding it all up, we come out with negative 200, 2,000, sorry, 220 kilojoules is the net energy for the reaction. Because we see this negative sign, that means it's going to be released, which means this overall process is exothermic. So this is one way that we can actually go about finding the delta H for the reaction just using the information given to us in the table as well as 
um, using the overall reaction and its states. Now, heat of fusion and heat of vaporization are not something you hear often, well, not something we use a whole lot often, but just keep in mind what's going to happen. Heat molar heat of fusion, the amount of energy required for one mole, and you see that molar in front, one mole of a solid to a liquid state to be transferred to a liquid state. So, from solid water to liquid, makes perfect sense, is where it's going to fuse, quote unquote, together. Now, it's usually going to be greater for ionic substances than molecular or covalent compounds because the ionic substances are actually going to be held together a lot closer. Now, molar heat of vaporization, the fusion is where it's coming from solid to a liquid state. Vaporization is where it's going from a liquid to a gaseous state. Notice that. Still dealing with one mole to go from liquid to gas. And we have water to steam, quote unquote. 40.67 kilojoules per mole. We're going to use these as conversion factors, so just keep them in mind overall. This is where we're actually going to end it for the night. Um, and make sure you go and do your practice. Have bring any questions you have, and we'll uh, make sure we can get them answered for you. Have a good evening, and look forward to seeing you in class.